We begin there this evening. We'll move quickly tonight. Got a lot of ground to cover. And uh, here, it's an old rainy, cold evening in January. You don't have nowhere else to go. Uh, it's still early. So uh, please uh, lend me your ear tonight. And um, be patient with me tonight as we're going to cover this. We've got to get this done. Acts chapter number 8. This is during the days. Somehow or another, I'm not on, y'all. Amen. One, two. Acts chapter number 8. This is during the days when the apostles were still alive, the disciples preaching the gospel. So the Lord had only been killed and went back to heaven just a short time before this. This is the days of the book of Acts. And I want you to notice what he said in verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church. That's what we've been studying, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they, here we come now, that were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. Now, I want to preach tonight the fourth and final message in this series, Baptist and their book. The Bible said that early church got scattered abroad and they went everywhere Preaching the word. That's where them people come from. In the days of the apostles, while they were still living, the days that was under pagan Rome, before there ever was a Catholic church. The Catholic church didn't begin until uh, really uh, right there, 313 A.D. with that fellow named Constantine. But these people were preaching the word of God and over three million Christians were murdered and killed during that time. That's a, a, a conservative estimate. Now the Bible said there was great persecution against the church. What we've been showing you here uh, is that these people here, Monetus, they, this was a man, that was his name. So they called the people that followed him Monetus as a nickname, as a joke, sort of. And they were Novation, same thing. Donatus, same thing. And did you know that these people way back here believed everything basically that you and I believe tonight? So the basic belief of the Baptist church has been passed right on down through history all the way to where we are right here in 2018. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you, uh, you realize that they were not always called Baptist. They were called Paulicians because they studied the epistles of Paul. They were called the Waldensons because uh, Valdez, Valdez, right across the road over there. We are standing in the corner, our church of Valdez, where the Waldensons came over here and settled right over there across the interstate for, for the persecution that they had endured. They murdered them people by the thousands and tens of thousands. And because they wouldn't go along with papal Rome, Papal Rome started there, and Papal Rome come all these old crazy superstitious junk like infant baptism, the Eucharist, Mariolatry. We studied all of that, purgatory, confession to the priest, uh, 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 baptism by uh, infant, that was a big thing, baptizing babies. And the reason you baptize babies is to keep them in your church forever. And these people said no. And so there is an unbroken trail of blood going from what we have here tonight all the way back to the days of the apostle. They were not always called the same name. Their enemies gave them nicknames, but they all believed the same thing. If you want to get right down to it, the oldest denominational word, denominational word is Anabaptist. 
That was used before the word Catholic was. Anna means again. It means they made them get baptized again when they come over from the Catholic Church and got saved. Infant baptism, no good. And they died for it. If you missed last Sunday night, I showed you videos of, of how the Christians were murdered and burned at the stake. Thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Now, I'm going to give you what Baptists believe, uh, and we're all in part one of this message tonight, on what we've said so far. I'm going to use acrostics, you know, B-A-P-T-I-S-T. If you want to write this down, B. If you want to write basically what we believe, write down it like this and write B and write out beside it, Baptists believe the Bible as the sole authority in all matters of faith and practice. That means we believe that what the Bible says is right, not what some leader says, not what some her head says, not what some angel, uh, somebody had a dream uh, or in a prayer book or in some kind of liturgy or something like that. The Bible is the absolute infallible, inspired soul. That's what Luther, That's what Martin Luther said there. Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura. Scripture only. Scripture only. And that's what they fought of. The A in Baptist. The A means the autonomy of the local church. That means that every church is autonomous. We make our own decisions. Uh, no church can tell another church how to operate, what to do, how to spend its money, what missionary to support the autonomous. The P in Baptist stands for the priesthood of the believer. And that means any Christian, an eight-year-old kid in here, can go directly into God Almighty and come boldly to the throne of grace and we're a royal priesthood. We don't need an earthly priest to get us to God. The Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest and every Christian is a priest. The word I, B A P. T, I'm sorry, T, comes out to that, means two ordinances. The local church, the Baptist church has only two ordinances, and that is baptism and the Lord's Supper. They are not sacraments. Sacraments is a wrong word. It's ordinances. They neither one have nothing to do with your salvation. Baptism is a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And the Lord's Supper is this due in remembrance that he broke his body to him. Neither one of them are supernatural. Transubstantiations of the devil. Consubstantiation, Lutheran, Episcopalian, you know, is of the devil. And uh, only in remembrance of him. The letter I in Baptist means immersion version of the believers only. We do not baptize babies. I told you, these people here that came out of the Catholic Church, Protestant Reformation, Luther, Lutheran, John Calvin, John Knox, Presbyterian, Alexander Campbell, Church, uh, Church of Christ, uh, and then the Anglican Church of England, when they come over here, they call that Episcopalian. And, the, and then the all of the other, all of the other, Methodist, John Wesley, every single one of those groups are messed up on the doctrine of baptism. Most of them will baptize or sprinkle a baby. Baptists don't baptize babies. Amen? We wait, a person has to know that they're a sinner, come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and repent and be saved then they get baptized. That's one of the articles of the Baptist faith. And S, S would be total separation of church and state. We don't believe in a church state. These groups here, even when they come to America, saw that stuff about church state. I'll go over some of that in just a minute. And these church and state people here, they, uh, uh, we believe that the state has no authority over a church and that no certain denomination or church Church should be sanctioned by the state and enforced by law. And then the, uh, the T is two offices. Two offices in a Baptist church, pastor and deacon. Pastor, bishop, same thing, overseer, under shepherd, and deacons. That's what we believe as Baptist. Now, I'm going to give you some quotes what authors have said about the Baptist. Now listen to these. There's a bunch of them. And some of these authors that wrote these books were not even Baptist. S.E. Tall, historian, quote, Now we come to the Baptist denomination. Who organized the first Baptist church? What was the date of its establishment? Who formulated its articles of faith? In answer to these questions, I assert 
that the first Baptist church was organized by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, during his personal ministry on earth. That's what the historians say. J.H. Grime said, quote, All true Baptist churches are legitimate successors of the first church constituted by Christ himself, just as every man now living is a legitimate successor of Adam, the first man. Quote, R.B. Cook, quote, Baptists are able to trace their distinctive principles to the apostolic age when from the union of the church and the state became generally corrupt. There still remain in obscure places churches and sects which maintain the pure doctrines and ordinances of Christ and it is certain that these churches and sects held substantially the same principles as are held by the distinctive view of the Baptist. That means Baptists were never Protestants. We are not, you don't say we're, we're, we're Jews or Protestants. There's Jews, Protestants, and Baptists. We're never in the Catholic Church. We do protest, but we never came out of Rome because we were never in it. Now, they listen to this. They begin uh, this. The Baptists, uh, you've heard me say, uh, they begin, our country was built because and blessed because of Baptist principles. When they first came here, you may not know this, but actually they tried to make state religion in America. The Congregationalist and the Presbyterian up north and the Church of the Episcopal Church down south. Up in Massachusetts, they tried to make the, the Congregationalist Church the rule. You had to be a Congregationalist or you had to be a Presbyterian. Down south, it was the uh, Church of England or the Episcopal Church, North South Carolina and Virginia. Same, they tried to get that done. But there were some old Baptist preachers that got on fire for God, uh, uh, Leland, uh, John Cook, uh, Roger Williams, some of those guys. Roger Williams began a Baptist church in the early 1600s, and it only lasted a few months. John Clark uh, found a small piece of land way up north that had not been claimed by a colony. And they said, we would like to settle here and preach and make Baptist churches here. You know that piece of land as Rhode Island. It wasn't called that then. Now in 1638, uh, they went to England to get a legal charter to do this because nothing like that had ever been done. What John Clark believed in had never happened. And so they, 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 uh, they went and to, to England. Twelve years later, he came back with a legal charter and had permission to do it. And ladies and gentlemen, Rhode Island was the first spot on earth where religious liberty was made law. In other words, the law of Rhode Island said you can worship anything you want, any way you want, any time you want, complete religious liberty. It wasn't long till that got the attention of other places. And it took a while, but Virginia, after that, followed suit, and then finally the whole United States went that way because George Washington, James Madison, and, uh, and uh, John Adams, they got together and they said, you know what, these people are on to something. These people have got something figured out right. And they got together and they come up with the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights, are you listening to me? The Bill of Rights gave people the liberty to believe what they want that, that's where you get your right to bear arms from the Bill of Rights. That's where you get your right to have a fair trial from the Bill of Rights. No other nation in history had ever been done like that, not even England. Have you ever wondered why God blessed America? Have you ever wondered why God had blessed America like no other nation has ever been blessed outside of Israel itself back in the Old Testament? It's because Patrick Henry and them guys, you know Patrick Henry rode for hours on a horse to defend three Baptist preachers and a trial and he wasn't even a Baptist and old Patrick Henry what's he famous for give me what liberty or give me what death he said I'll die for it if I have to and, Ab uh, and George Washington and them guys said these guys are on to something they declared religious liberty and that my friends is the foundation of the country that you and I live in and these poor people who are ignorant and can't salute the flag and won't honor our country don't even realize uh, the greatness that God has blessed America in and with and because of the principle 
troubles of the Baptist preachers. I tell you, listen, you teach it however you want to, but I'll tell you one thing, brother. In my studies, I've found out when we get to heaven, we'll find out that God blessed the efforts of those Baptist preachers and gave us religious liberty in this country. Now we're going to change gears here just a little bit. Let's change gears just a little bit. Number two, the Bible. Baptists and their Bible. There are two lines of Bible in this world. Did you know these people there that I've been talking about, the Waldensians? Valdes means Waldensian in Italian. That's what the word means, Valdes. That's who settled across the road over here. We are a part of that same group. Maybe not physically, maybe we are, I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing, them people, you know what their nickname was? They called them people of the book. People of the book. That them people, all they do is read that book. All they do, it's Bible, Bible, Bible. Everything that comes up, it's Bible, Bible, Bible. The every question that comes up, it's the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. I say, amen, I do wish and claim to be identified with people of the book. Amen? Yes, sir. I'll tell you, the Waldensian were characterized by that. They were separatists, monetists, donatists, Albigenses, Waldensian, even Luther himself. And the, and the reformers said, Scripture only, only Scripture. Now, you've heard me teach this before. There's two lines of Bibles. All the Bibles you got in the world today, they come out of here, out of Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria, Egypt, atop of the world. That's where the Roman Catholic Bible come from. Old Constantine told uh, uh, Eusebius, uh, Augustine, he said, uh, go down there and get me 50 copies of the Bible. And they'd done been messing with it. They'd already been cutting verses out. Origin and them guys had been cutting verses out of it. He said, get me 50 copies of it. That became what we know as the Alexandrian text. Down here, they used a scripture come from Antioch, Syria. That's a Syrian type text. The Bible you got in your lap tonight comes from a Greek text that is Syrian in type. And that can be proved all as you come to Texas Receptus. You'll, we'll, you, you've heard me say that over and over and over. Now, these people here, they come from a, uh, uh, the other type of text that left out tons of verses and chopped it up. This verses, these Bibles here were preached right on through, popped up here. He started using them, Martin Luther's Bible, and then they all started preaching them here, and that's the Bible that me and you got laying on your uh, lap tonight. The, the, uh, they contain the, this, this book down here. That's why your Catholic Bible up there contains the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is 15 books that are not in your Bible. Don't, don't fall for such foolish things as lost books of the Bible. The word apocrypha means hidden. And it means hidden from the general public because it's too deep for them to understand. It has books like Tobit, Judith, the Maccabees, Bell and the Dragon, and the Snake, and so forth and so on. The Bible itself does not contain the apocrypha. I'll give you three reasons. One, one the, the, the Apocrypha don't claim to be inspired. Number two, there were, the Apocrypha was never quoted by Jesus or the New Testament writers. And number three, none of them was ever regarded as inspired by the early church. Now, you'll hear a lot of critics of, of ours say, well, you people don't even realize. I, how many of you ever heard this? You people don't even have the King James. I heard a preacher say, if you had the King James 16, 11, you couldn't even read it. You don't have, how many of you ever heard people? And preachers make foolish statements like that when they, they, they got a found, somebody told them something and they fell for it because they want to find fault with the Bible. I understand that the original 1611 Bible had words spelled different than this. Like the word music, it would be M-U-S-I-C-K, palm, had an F in it, psalm, they pronounced the S like Fs and stuff like that. In 1769, those words were changed to the way they are now. The wording wasn't changed. The spelling is all that was changed. So you have the 1611 Bible in your hands right here. That's very important you get that. It never contained the Apocrypha as a part of it. Them old 1611 Bibles had the Apocrypha in it 
Apocrypha in it between the Testaments with a note that said it's not part of the canon. It's just inspirational reading. The Catholic Bible has the Apocrypha as part of the inspired text. The 1611 said no, it is not canonical. So, in, in 1880, they were digging around, back right in here somewhere. 1880, they were digging around, and they found two manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Vaticanus, because that sounds like Vatican, Vatican, and they found one in a monastery and the other one in a, in a trash can somewhere and, and in a cave, and they said, oh, my goodness, these manuscripts are older than the Textus Receptus. Therefore, they must be more accurate. And there's where you got your new Bibles from, ASV, RSV, NIV. I got them laying in there on my desk. I've checked them. I'm going to give you verses to check to make sure you got the right text. About that time back before this happened, the old Syriac was used in 200 AD and matches the reading of the King James Bible. In 300 AD, Erasmus matched the reading of the King James Bible. And William Tyndale, back there in 1536, he got his Bible uh, from John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was called the Morning Star, you know, and all of that. And William Tyndale got his Bible and he put that Bible in English. And he put that Bible in English and they killed him for it. They burned him. And he was talking to the Catholic b bishop one day and the Catholic bishop, they kept it in Latin. The Catholic Church kept the Bible in Latin all the dark ages because they know them poor people couldn't read it. If they could read it, they'd find out what a bunch of crooks that was and get out of that mess. And they kept them in the dark, told them they was going to hell if they didn't do everything they said and they them in bondage. And ladies and gentlemen, William Tyndale said no. And you know what he said? He said, I'll live to see the day when the boy that drives a plow down through the weeds and the field knows more scripture than the Pope in Rome. And he said, God being my heifer, I'll see that happen. And William Tyndale's Bible was published. They burned him at the stake, broke his neck out there at the stake, set him on fire. And William Tyndale, this is 1536, and William Tyndale's dying prayer as he was dying said, Lord, open the king of England's eyes and died. And a few years later, the king of England's eyes was open. His name was James. James, the same word as Jacob, Israel. And King James gave the order and the quote of the command in 1604 to translate the Bible. There were 54 scholars chosen. It wasn't just a few rich people sitting around in an air-conditioned office and a company to make money off of it. 54 scholars. They were at Cambridge, Westminster, and Oxford. They would get together once every six months or so and compare their scriptures. So they had this many, they had this many, they had this many, and every scripture had to pass 14. Teen legitimate tests before it would be considered every chapter in the Bible considered the Word of God. They got together, they compared their notes, and I'm telling you something, people, they believed that they were handling the very words of God Almighty. And God used that committee in May of 1611, the greatest book the world's ever seen. And there's been more people saved, more missionaries went out, more churches built, more lives changed by the preaching of that blessed book right there than any book that's ever been on this world. They ain't nothing like it. We don't need a new one, brother. We need that right there. The thing there gets a job done. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful I've got a Bible I can believe in. I'm glad I don't have to say. Let me give you some checkpoints if you want to check your Bibles. Let me write down these scriptures, and anybody tries to show you another Bible's right, all you got to do is give them these verses, okay? Let me give it to them, then we want to move to another subject. Check 1 John 5, 7. Verse on the Trinity. If they don't have that, uh, the God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, they're wrong. Check Acts 8, 37. Write it down. Somebody at work says, what's wrong with my Bible? Show them Acts 8, 37. It ain't even in their Bible. Talking about a man believing on the Lord to get saved. Show them Daniel 3.25 where Jesus is called a son of the gods. False doctrine. And check Luke 2.33 where it says J Joseph is Jesus' father. 
That's false doctrine. Your King James said, and his, and his mother, Joseph and his mother. That's correct. The new Bible say his father and mother. Joseph wasn't his father, y'all. That's a slam against the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chet, those are easy. Any layman can take those verses and show a person his Bible. Acts 8, 37 is enough to get rid of it. All right, now we're going to change gears again. The third gear in this sermon tonight. If all this I've said is true, why are so many churches today ceasing to be Baptist? I mean, it's every time you turn around, you go down the road. Didn't that church used to be? What is it now? And the name's gone. I can tell you four right within this area just in the last couple of years that are no longer Baptists. What is this? What is this movement that's going around? Now, I'm going to give you four reasons. Why? First of all, I want to tell you this. You do not have to have the word Baptist on your sign. You know what the Bible don't say you don't have to. Lester Roloff was a great Baptist, one of the greatest preachers ever lived. His church was named the People's Church all those years. Uh, that's, that's fine. And that's between him and the Lord. I'm not saying that you have to have Baptist. Don't, don't get me wrong. Don't go crazy and, and make me say something I ain't saying. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, I, there's a lot of good people in other churches. Listen, the old circuit riding Methodist preachers were some of the greatest preachers this world's ever seen. John Wesley was a Methodist. George Whitfield was a Methodist. But when they preached the great Cumberland Valley Revival, all their, church, their converts wound up in Baptist churches. And they were the beneficiaries of George Whitfield's ministry. They were wrong on baptism, but they were, they were right in their holy living and their, their life. Some of those old Church of God women, some of the old-time Pentecostals, and some of them were some of the greatest Christians. I mean, I mean, some fine people. Would you say amen to that? That loved the Lord. So don't, don't get me wrong. Don't say anything. I think, oh, Baptists are the only ones right. No, I don't think that at all. I mean, there's some Baptists as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Hey, no, there's some Baptists as mean as the devil. Lots of them. But I'm, I'm just telling you what's right doctrinally. Now, why, why, why does a preacher decide that he no longer wants to be Baptist? All right? Four reasons. Number one, number one, when a preacher decides, I don't want our church to have the Baptist name on it no more, number one, it's either he is ignorant of the history of the ancient Baptist and just took a church who already had that name and didn't realize what he had. That's a possibility. And don't know the history of the Baptist church. Number two, he has become to believe doctrine that is inconsistent with Baptist faith, especially the new doctrine. You'll notice that I ain't talked much about Assembly of God, Church of God, Fire Baptized, Holy Ghost, Church of God in Jesus' name. All those didn't start till 1900 at the Azusa Street Mission out there in Los Angeles, California. Sometime I had a friend of mine up way up north, y'all don't even know him. His wife thought she got the gift of tongues and he had a Baptist church and gradually they all changed and sometimes that happens. He did it because his wife went that way and the whole church followed her. And I could always tell by the music and the atmosphere that something wasn't right. And I preached there many, many, many times. Especially new doctrine. Charismatic, healing, that type of thing. When a preacher starts believing that, he starts saying, well, these Baptists, are, they don't really, they're there. So I'm going to drift that way. So let's take it off the sign, okay? That's the second reason. And they don't know, they're confused, really, confused about Bible doctrine of healing, the Bible doctrine of tongues, the Bible doctrine of all. God can do anything. I ain't saying God's limited, but they don't understand the biblical doctrine of that. Number three, he wants to avoid the stigma. And this is most of the time. There's some weird, crazy people in our country called Baptists. Westboro, up yonder, y'all know, that hold up signs that say, uh, God wants soldiers dead and hates uh, uh, uh certain people, you know, and stuff like that. Sometimes they say, man, I don't want to be identified with that. And I don't either, but it ain't my fault. Somebody calls themselves Castle and they're crazy. Uh, I ain't going to change my name just because I got some crazy. And I got some crazy ones. Believe me. Pharisaical, judgmental. Sometimes independent Baptists can be the most smart aleck, self-righteous, judgmental people on the face of this earth. Almost sickening to be around. I can understand why a lot of preachers wouldn't want to be one. If I had to be around some of them all the time, I wouldn't either. Just to be fair about it, amen? Number four, 
And this is the biggest reason a church refuses to be Baptist anymore, and that's to attract the crowd. Because, see, if you take that name down, you get people who was raised Pentecostal, and they'll come, and you get people who was raised uh, a, a Seventh-day Adventist, and they'll come just because you got a good youth program or a pretty building or activities for the kids, and you can build it, build it, build it, and just don't preach no doctrine. And that's the main one. And then, see, Rick Warren and that bunch started this uh, stuff. And Rick Warren and them, they said, you go into a community, and you go into this community. I'm not nowhere near through, y'all, so you just sit there real still. i got to get this out of me. It's been in me for months, and it's coming out. I'm telling you, they start out, you know what he done, Brother Jason? You know what that man done? They go into a community and say, why don't you people go to church? Give us all your reasons. And they say, I don't go to church because this. I don't go to church because this. They say, okay, we're going to fix all that. Somebody says, I don't like to go to church because it's stiff. Okay, we'll make one that ain't stiff. Laid back. I don't like that old-fashioned singing. Okay, we'll put cool music in there. We'll fix that. You want to come? I don't like the way you have to dress up, just have you. One church, not far from here, I read their, their little thing, like a card or website or whatever they put out, and it said, come to our church. It said, what is our dress code? We don't have one. We don't have a dress code. I said, that's a lie. You do too. Come in there topless and watch what happens. They'll have a dress code real quick. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was. Hey, listen, listen, brother, they have standards. They're just lower than others. And they said, we don't like that music. Okay, we'll get a rock band. We don't like it all light. Okay, we'll paint the ceiling black and we'll dim the lights and we'll even have it smoky looking here so you'll feel comfortable like you're in a nightclub. We don't like uh, somebody screaming at Okay, we'll talk cool and, and we'll do like this. Say, no, you're not hearing me. No, you're not hearing me. No, you're not hearing me. Junk like that right there. I didn't preach it. Some kind of sissified bunch of mess like that to make people feel good. Hey, preaching never has been like that. Preaching is authoritative. Preacher comes from the Word of God. And brother, we need somebody to get to preach the absolute devil out of us ever since. They don't like that. They advertise and say, are you tired of church? Come to our church. Are you ready to connect? It's an internet church. And all you hear basically is, God is out to help you. See, it's a feel-good Seeker sensitive, generic sermons. You can't really find anything wrong with them, but what it's all about is God's interested in helping you get through your day. Never hell. Never eschatology. Eschatology is the doctrine of future events. They say don't preach that, it's too divisive, it causes division. Never, it's always coping with your feelings. Never, never judgment. Never, never the millennial reign. Always just, now, you feel good now, don't you? You're not hearing me. No, you're not hearing me. You know, bull like that right there. I can't even act like that. I'll tell you one thing, brother. I, I, I don't want to hear a sissy preacher. Something wrong with you if you do. Amen. Amen. Now, man said this. Man said this. He said, but why do you have to? I heard a man say this. He said, why do you have to have the labels? Why is there labels? Wouldn't it be better if there were no labels? Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Church of God, Pentecostal, Church of Christ, Lutheran, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, uh, Apostolic, Church of God, and fire baptized, snake handling Jesus' name. Uh, wouldn't it be better if there were no labels? Well, let's apply that logic to anything else. I'm glad there are labels when I go to the grocery store. I would hate to walk in the grocery store and all you see on this shelf is a bunch of cans that look like that. No labels. How am I going to get that one right there? Is that noodle soup or dog food? If there ain't no label on it, you don't know what you're getting. And there's a reason they don't put a label on it. They don't want you. They want you to just think. They say, well, just church is church. Why can't we just all be called the Christians? Why can't they just all be cans? 
What if you had all the drinks up there, two liter drinks, and they all, is that, is that Dr. Pepper? Is it Pepsi? Is it Coke? Is it Sam's Cola? I want to know what I'm getting. Listen, if I, go, if I go on vacation and I want to go to church, I want to look and know what a church is and what it believes and what it stands for. You can waste a lot of time going places and, and you ain't going to get nothing. How many of you have been on vacation and thought you was going to get something and you went in somewhere and it wasn't nothing? Yes, sir, brother. I want to know. There ain't nothing wrong with putting a label on something. You say, well, don't you think that causes division? Well, well okay. I would go buy you a car. What kind of cars do you sell here? Oh, we don't have labels. We just sell cars. Is it a Toyota? It, no, that's labels. Is it a Ford? Is it a Chevrolet? Son, you go on that window of that car, and it don't tell you it just, just it's a Ford. It tells you the cylinders. It tells you the horsepower. It tells you every little detail of what you're getting. And if somebody says, no, we just sell cars. They're, they're crooked. There's something up there somewhere. They're trying to, uh, uh, I want to know what I'm getting. And you shouldn't be ashamed of what you are. And by the way, you're something. Every one of these churches that don't have a name, the tree, the flower, the, the limb, the, the, and I'm not being ugly. Some of my friends, I got good friends that pastor churches like that. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but some of them don't know what they are, but they're something. And most of them are Baptist. They're either Baptist or charismatic in their beliefs. Almost every one, 99%. Some of them don't know what they believe. Hey, Amen. I want a Porsche. Well, we don't have labels. I want a Volkswagen. What well, if you went to a restaurant? Can I see a menu? We don't, we don't have labels here. We just have food. Would you like food? Well, what kind of food you got? Oh, we don't give labels. We just have food. Whatever you bring out, that's what you get. And if he's, oh boy, now we don't have divisions. We just all go to a restaurant and eat. Nuh uh, nuh uh. Anybody with a discerning mind and heart says, whoa, here, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. I want chicken. I want fried oysters. I want french fries. I want a hamburger. We're just saying, but when it comes to church, oh well, we don't say what we believe. It's just church. You better find out. You better find out, amen? amen. I'm telling you, I mean, you might be buying a bottle of liquor, brother. I'm going to change gears one more time and I'm done. Amen. This is going to be the hard part for some of you. Let's find out what happens to the enemies of God's people down through the years. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation 17. Not in the Catholic Bible. They never put it in until the Protestants started fussing, raising Cain about it. But the original Catholic Vaticanus and Sinaiticus does not contain the book of Revelation. Revelation 17. I'm going to read you about a religious whore in the Bible. This whore is responsible for the martyrs and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm about to show you is in your Bible. It's very controversial. It caused wars. People fight over it. But my job is to preach it to you, and here it is. Let's look at it. Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore. This is during the great tribulation, that sitteth upon many waters. Now, many waters is defined in verse 15. Look at verse 15. And he saith to me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongue. The Roman Catholic Church, has, uh, the, the pagan Rome, papal Rome, set upon the nations and the peoples of the world and ruled them when that was written. Rome ruled the world when this was written, when John wrote this. So we've already got it defined. The woman is sitting on people, nations, and languages. Rome has ambassadors today in almost every nation on earth, and there are one billion people who are under control of the Roman Catholic Church today directly, not counting the indirectly. Now, look at verse 2 with whom the kings of the earth, these are senators and congressmen and presidents, have committed fornication. So this is a woman who commits fornication with the rulers of the world, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk 
with the wine of her fornication. Just like Belshazzar in the Old Testament drank out of the sacred vessels, Holy Mother Church blaspheming the name of God. Now, move on quickly. Verse 3. Who is this woman? He carried me away in the spirit, and I saw a woman on a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearl, having a golden cup in her hand with abominations and filthiness of the earth. All right, we got it nailed down. This is a religious woman who ruled over the kings of the earth whose colors are purple and scarlet and gold embroidery. Look at any big Catholic gathering of pictures in the world and them cardinals and them priests and them popes, it's purple and scarlet. And the golden cup is that abomination of that wine drinking and the mass that they believe is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me? I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just saying it's a city whose colors are purple and scarlet, whose symbol is a gold cup, who worship and pagan ungodly stuff. And verse 6 said, I saw the drunken uh, woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. That's not pagan Rome. Papal Rome. She's drunk with the blood of the martyrs of the Lord Jesus Christ. You want me to show them to you? 50 million estimated. Verse 8. Now remember, so far we got a woman whose colors are scarlet and purple, a golden cup, sets on the nations of the world and kills the Christians what we got so far. Verse 8. Verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was, this is Antichrist, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now I ain't got time to explain that whole verse, but it said, this is John writing. He said, the beast that she's writing was. That means that beast had been here. And is not. It wasn't there when he was writing and shall ascend out of the pit and go into perdition. There's only two people in the Bible called the son of perdition. Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist. And the, John said that king, that beast, was on the earth, but wasn't there when he was writing, and is coming back out of the pit. That's why Judas didn't go to hell when he died. It said he went to his own place. And the spirit of Judas Iscariot will ascend out of the pit in the tribulation and inhabit the body of the Antichrist as the son of perdition. That's what's going to happen. Verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Here's the interpretation. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. It's a woman who's a city, who's scarlet and colored, uh, gold colored cups and robes and sits on seven mountains. Anybody ever studied history? What's the city of seven hills? That's why it ain't the Catholic Bible. I wouldn't put it in there either if I was them. It's a city on seven mountains that is riding the beast that killed the saints that has a golden cup. Look, let's finish this up here and I'll be done. Verse 13. These all have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So that's what's going to happen during tribulation. They're all going to get together and have one world religion. I'm going to tell you something, people. They're trying, the Pope right now is trying to pull all religions together. And he's paving the way for the anger. Have you heard of Chrislam? Chrislam? You're going to hear it more and more. That's Christianity and Islam. Blending it together. And I'm telling you, the reason we got this mega church movement, the reason we got all this stuff, drop your labels, drop your man, is to pull everybody back to old Holy Mother, the Roman Catholic Church. And that's where they're going. Kenneth Copeland, 
You seen that stuff about him? And I don't even know the guy. I don't have nothing against him personally. He's crazy, but I don't have nothing against him personally. But he, uh, they got hobnobbed and hooked up saying it's the, the Reformation was a mistake. We all need to get back together. Let's all get back together with Rome. Let's all get back together with Rome. No! Our fathers died to come out of that mess. Last thing we need to do is get back in it. Verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast shall hate the whore and make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. That's what's going to happen to old Rome, buddy. They're going to burn it down. Thank God. You say, how do you know for sure? John wrote this, verse 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Present tense. When John wrote it, Rome reigned over the kings of the earth. John didn't say this is a woman that's going to reign over them up in the future. It's the woman right now that reigns over there. It's Rome. And that's where it's headed. I thank God this evening that we've got a book as Christians. And this book... I like that song. I, I started asking him if we, I don't even think we got it in our book. It says, and when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. I'll tell you something tonight, folks. We ought to be thank God that we're hooked up with the church of Jesus Christ that goes all the way back to the apostles. If I say something that's against this book, don't listen to me. You go by the book. If I get up here and I start talking crazy and I've lost my mind, and I'd have to lose it. I go crazy. Say, uh, brother, we love you and everything, but uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, the book, the book. Stick with the book. Stick. We're people of the book. I preached on Baptist and their book. Now, I've given you enough to swallow tonight. Take you a long time. You might have to get this CD and get this over and over and over and over and get all I've said. I've covered a lot of ground. And I hope God will use it to make us stronger than where we stand. Let's stand by our heads for prayer. Come on, play something, Stacy. We'll, we'll just have a little prayer here tonight. And then I want to do something else before we leave. Is God speaking to your heart tonight? Is God speaking to your heart? Brother Danny, I need to be more dedicated to the Lord, to the church, to the, to the Bible. After my father's died to give me a Bible, I shouldn't just leave it laying. I should be honored to read it every day. The Waldensons did. The Albigensons did. The Bogomiles did. The Huguenots did. The Paulicians did. The Cathari did. The Petrogusians did. They were honored to read God's Word. What a privilege. Lord, I thank you for this study that we've had. God, I know I'm, I'm very, very ignorant. And God, I know that I'm very, very feeble. And I hadn't, been, I hadn't done this subject justice tonight to even scratch the surface. But I pray, dear God, that somehow you might take what I've said and use it for the glory of God to help people stay right and straight. Lord, help us to love you, to serve you, to do the right thing even until the bitter end. We don't know what that end might be, but help us to stand for what's right. We'll thank you for it. We love you. Bless our church. Cause it to grow and prosper for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake.